6 o'clock. I'm calling this meeting to order. Please rise for the pledge. Krista, would you like to lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. First, approval of minutes. Was everybody able to look over the minutes? Anybody have any corrections that weren't made? None. Looking for a motion to approve the minutes. Move to approve as directed. Thank you, Rebecca. Second. You have a second. Thank you, Jack. It's been moved and seconded. Any comments? Rebecca. Um, I remembered on the minutes that we had a lot of discussion when the chamber came to talk, and I just was hoping at some point tonight there'd be an update on if we have made an appointment to uh, follow up with them, so everyone wanted to, and just to make sure we get an update on that. Do you want to comment on that later, or now? Um, I, I will mention it right now. Okay. We have a meeting set up uh, between a couple of the chamber board members. Heather and myself are going with the idea that we are going to brainstorm how we are going to build this partnership. Yes. Good job, Paula. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Any public comment? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Up next, public comment. Do we have any public comment tonight? Seeing none. Okay, we'll move on. Okay. Personal action items. Liz? Heather, I'll move to six. <laughs> okay. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this? None? Liz, do you have an, anything you want to talk about with this? The standard. Of a couple of so our school psychologists, it's going to be a hard still spot, and we're going to go with how it's gone in the past. Um, and then we are reworking the uh, facility supervisor position that was resigned, operation facility, um, and that proposal will come to personnel on February 7th. That's it. Any further discussion? Any questions? Seeing none. And moved and seconded. Any public comments? Nope. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you, Liz. <coughs> Next, notice the bargain. Liz, I knew you had two. Oh, okay. <laughs> Liz, you're up. Um, this is our maintenance union. Just notice that they intend to purchase. Okay. Start deadline. <coughs> Any discussion on this? Just information only. Moving on. AEA early retirement, Liz. Um, so when we brought this initial MOA to the Finance Committee, it had a two-year offering this year and next year. The thought behind that was that um, pensions to retire have to be turned in by March 1st. So with that short of a timeline, offering the two-year money um, the committee, however, decided to go with a one-year recommendation, and then they upped the amount. Um, we started at 12. They landed at 20. Um, that's what's represented here. We were waiting to put it on our agenda until um, <clears throat> we got the language back from TRS, and it was approved and okayed by legal counsel. So both of those things have been done. And this... Um, 
MOA as it's written would allow this to be completely in addition to anything in the CBA. It would also allow any staff member in the KEA um, in our fourth or fifth bullet point in black, um, as long as they've met those TRS requirements to return, they can add this into their retirement. So there, uh, there may be, uh, if enough people decide to take this, may have to amend our retirement plan, which you'll see at a later date. Um, that's permissive levy, but that wasn't originally budgeted for uh, here. Um, two questions. Um, one, can you explain kind of, first of all, is this something we do regularly or is there some sort of extraordinary circumstances to why we're doing this now? And second, is this something that we, um, can you explain holistically how this fits into the picture of where we're going and how we're getting there? And it ties into our budget, but I want to start with It, the, the motivation originated um, with the budget conversation that the conversation started. Currently, we have about 13 of, uh, 33%, sorry, of our certified staff are topped out on our salary range. So that makes us very heavy on the top end. And um, this is just to give those who are maxed out and think about retirement and incentives. With a pretty significant cost savings, even if all of those positions are replaced, um, <clears throat> the first year savings aren't as significant. But third years are where we would realize those. And I guess um, we ever offered anything like this? I think yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah I would Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we have. It's just been very infrequent that we do it, and it's been typically related to budget, budgetary issues in the second and third year. Like what Chris was saying, the first year is going to be a break even for the most part, and it's the second and third year where we're, we're going to be having real budgetary issues. In the past, it's been – so back in – the most significant incentive was back in – 98 or 99 when we did the 30-year uh, retirement and you get your health insurance paid for from that point until age 65 and then that was modified a little bit. And there was one other time we did what, so I think this is, might be the third one in the last 30 years that had a, an incentive of some kind. And I guess maybe question directed at Liz, do we feel confident that people do opt to take this? that we will be able to fill these positions in light of the salary that we offer for interest. Living all the things that go into why we have unfilled, and we don't have any future unfilled positions on our list. We only just want to go there. So confidence in being able to hire is um, not something I can just yet. We haven't had a problem. We have a problem here. All of our certified spot for filled at the start of school. Um, and even when we had some leaves throughout the school year, we've been able to fill those. Um, however, this is also going to be a move where um, if we're looking at removing a couple from the top, we might not have So if we're looking at it that way, we don't know if we're going to have any. You know, one other thing, too, is it becomes a matter of attrition. You eliminate positions without having to eliminate people. So if teachers take this retirement package and we don't have to risk, as we can go through attrition. Uh, there may be greater difficulties in the high school district than the elementary district because there's specialized curriculum in some areas that teachers may not be certified in, 
so we don't know the extent of that until we we actually get the uh, the attention of the of the individuals. The elementary level, both levels are critical from a budgetary point of view, but you know I don't know how difficult it will be to replace certain science teachers or or uh, math at at the higher levels there. Um, but that's what administration is for. Questions? Do we know how many teachers would be eligible for this? Do we know the number? Do we not? Okay. We also have, I mean, we greatly value our veteran teachers. Right. So having a balance in our district is really important, but also giving a nod to those year for years in our district. Something to honor and um, put forward. The other thing is we have a few teachers, I think there's six, who are past in the incentive to retire, so this would also actually longevity out of any sort of retirement. So when somebody's maxed out on the salary schedule, it might be, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I'm just going to pick a number, 77,000. But when you add benefits to it and so forth, it could be at 100,000. Whereas our hiring, even though entry level is step two at 36 or 38,000, I don't remember the number, but we've been hiring at uh, an average of step seven, which might be uh, 48, or we'll just say 50,000. I don't know the exact number. And benefits might push that up to 70,000 or, or 80,000. There's about a $20,000 savings in there. And, and that's where it's break even this year. But in subsequent years, there'll be that significant savings each year. And we we may end up using some uh, interlocal agreement money to cover some of this. We don't know for sure, but that's just part of the discussion. Question I had for Chris <coughs> is uh, uh, the retirement budget and mending it. The revenue from that though won't come from until next year, but that's where I assume the interlocal agreement would cover the added costs for that. Can you clarify how that might work or if it would work that way? Right. So um, budgeted funds are actually allowed to end the year in a negative. And so we would make up the, when we talk about amending, we're not talking about amending the taxes that the county is levying. We're just talking about amending the expenditure side. And the revenue would come in in the subsequent year. Thank you. So we'd be able to levy cover the deficit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Rebecca. Um, two questions. Um, I'd love to hear a little more about the thought process that went from the rating from 12 to 20. Um, that's why you might be the difference between the older teachers that you think teacher. But um and the other kind of question is when we're talking about that first year being relatively neutral, um, does that take into account the change in laws in the state incentives to hire new teachers with higher salaries or are we not in that place yet or any anything you can offer on those two? I'm the one that brought up the change. <laughs> but twelve thousand just is not enough of an incentive to have somebody to say I'm gonna watch. <laughs> 20,000 uh, just seems like it's more of it. It was an arbitrary number to come up with, but it, but going through, Chris is a is very good at Excel spreadsheets and being able to uh, illustrate examples very quickly. And so we played with different numbers, whether it was 12, 15, 20, 25, and looked to see where it would have uh, a positive impact and not a negative impact, and the break-even point was right around 20. There's still a little bit, you know, marginal savings, but it's better to just say break-even on that. And and uh, it's still up it to say, well, that can help make a difference with somebody's uh, contribution to TRS if they wanted to. And yes, we'll have some employment uh, um, aspect or some employer aspects to that adding to that, or matching some of that. But it was still better to get it up there to make that more appealing to people than $12,000 was. And as far as the teacher's incentive, that's for 
uh, beginning than not <coughs> individuals that are maxed out on the schedules. Perfect, but then we're talking about hiring. We, we may not rehire some of them. But, but to your point, Bill, the, the um, current criteria is, so let me back a little bit. You get an additional what's called quality educator payment if you are a double district and starting salary of teachers is equal to or, or uh, it is 70% of the average teacher pay across. <laughs> Currently, we're not uh, meeting that criteria. This, on its own, may push us to a point where we would. But it's also a conversation we've been having um, in some of our preliminary negotiation conversations on things if you get there. The rough numbers right now are we see about $150,000 of an increase to get us to that point, and it would cost in the neighborhood of $30,000 to $40,000 that are below that threshold up to it. Do you still have a question? Yeah, I'm less clear on my question. Um, so, a few of the things just weren't totally clear. Um, it's hard to want to let go of our veteran teachers when we talk so much about keeping employees. And so, the benefit is cost savings. And we don't know how many teachers will take it, but we do know how many could take it. Is there any kind of a ballpark that we're looking at, a, an estimate, for what kind of cost savings it will be as a trade-off for losing these positions, essentially? You're asking a qualitative question and not a quantitative question. How many teachers do qualify? Thirty six. Okay. Thirty three percent. So currently we have thirty three percent of our teachers maxed out on the salary schedule. Um, but the MOU is written so that it requires them to max out to also have ten years in the I don't know the ten year piece. might have a number. No, we don't. No? 150? No. Pete, no? I'm not okay. guessing. Did that answer your question, Ursula? Maybe. But there's no forcing here. The idea is if, if they were thinking, oh, I'm going to retire soon, this might say do it now rather than a year. I mean, I doubt anyone wants to be a teacher for the next 20 years is going to say, oh, for, you know, a third of a year's salary, I could leave early. I, I, yeah. I think it'll it be push it. 30, maybe push three years worth of one year, but not push 10 years worth. Any other questions on this? Further comments? Ursula, are you good? I don't, have, I don't have any questions. I'm just. Okay. I don't love this. I mean, I, I understand we're in a really rough budget place, but it just it feels potentially really big. Maybe I'm like overstating that. It just feels like potentially it would like could be a lot of people. And I guess I also I don't know. It's it, there's no we've been over this. There are no easy answers when it comes to saving on the budget. And so in this way, I get it because everything is optional. Everybody, it's you know, everybody has a choice here. But it is hard for me to think that, you know, here we are, potentially encouraging our best assets to retire early, earlier than they would, not early, earlier than they would. So that's just hard for me. But I, I do get it, and there are no easy answers here. So this is an answer. I move to approve this KEA early retirement incentive for fiscal year 23-24 as presented. 
Thank you, Jack. That has been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? None. Any public comment on this? None. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Negotiations update. Randy? Yeah, we just started the process of negotiation. We had our first meeting as a negotiation team last week. We'll have another one, uh, I think, first part of February. And negotiations with certified staff starts on February 12th. And then, of course, you just saw the uh, maintenance and ground notice for negotiation. So that'll be coming up next. And then also we have custodial uh, custodial group that we'll be um, negotiating with this year. So we have three separate groups that we're going to be negotiating with. And so we're starting off with certified, and then we'll put the others in as we progress. And it looks like uh, in uh, pulling the negotiations, we're going to go through all three negotiations. So it'll be a while of negotiation. Let's get started on February 12th. Okay. Good with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Resolution for emergency school cancellation. Randy. Okay, so this is for the this is for the Friday that we canceled school. Uh, what was that date? Twelfth. And uh, what we did is uh, because of the temperatures uh, with uh, reaching almost 30 below, and then of course the wind chill factor. We canceled school on a Friday, and then we also canceled all activities for that weekend. Uh, just to still the safe for our students to travel, for our students to be outside waiting for buses on that particular day. And so this is an emergency resolution. The board can declare an emergency uh, school closure uh, by declaration of emergency for one day of school year. And so we do not have to make this day up if you pass this resolution for an emergency. Anybody willing to make a motion? So move. Thank you, Ursula. I'll second. Second. Thank you, Jennifer. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? None. Rebecca? This is a more long-term discussion, but I'm always fascinated with the new proficiency standards and the idea of seat hours and, and just keeping an eye on, do we have to do this at all? If we're not losing proficiency, if the kids are still up to standard, I mean, it, I just think it's something to keep in mind overall whenever we think about snow days and think that Montana law has changed, and I'm not sure we've really integrated that change into our thought process or way of going about it. Question. Yep. Since the kids did online learning that day. No, it wasn't that day. Oh, it wasn't that day? That day. They, they had to do it. Oh, yeah. yeah. The Thursday was. When the students did the online learning, that was uh, we actually canceled it the following Thursday. We've had some interesting weather. That was because of the snowstorm. And so because they did online learning that day, we don't have to make that day up. Okay. That was my question. Back to the point of clarification. So you know, even with proficiency based education, we still have teachers and administrators and everybody that are under a uh, certain day contract. So like 187 days, you know, for the teachers and there's an entire schedule. So we're still obligated for those those folks. But if we pay, if we pay them for 187 days and they work for 186, we're not. That's what we're doing with this too. So. Right. Yeah. Any further discussion? None. So moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Up next, high school recommended course change. Pete. Um. So uh, new courses, new courses go through uh, an entire process. Uh, usually starts with uh, the staff member uh, re uh, requesting a new a new course, and then it goes through the department leaders, and then through the um, building administration. And then it comes to the uh, central office, and then once the central office has reviewed them and vetted them and um, gone through the questioning process, then we meet with the curriculum committee. Uh, that's usually prior to 
uh, Christmas and then give them about a month to uh, look through them, look over them, uh, make any tweaks, and then um, then the curriculum committee reviews them. So we reviewed them earlier on, uh, it wasn't the finance, it was on December or uh, January uh, 23rd that we reviewed them. Um, and then the courses before you were approved by the curriculum committee. Just a couple notes on them. So one on that timeline, it doesn't go to the finance committee. Um, the reason it doesn't go to the finance committee because it really doesn't impact um, the budget. So it's all FTE neutral. So that means if we're adding a class, then we're taking away a class. So a good example um, for that is, you know, if we're offering um, a Western Civ class, that's currently enrolled class at Glacier High School, um, then that would probably be a section of West of a regular Western Civ within our own curriculum that we're not offering. Uh, the other thing is, you know, you'll see, um, especially on the Glacier side, you'll see, you know, there's some fees and some different things. You also have to realize for any concurrent enrollment courses that that we receive funding from the college um, that goes into the district budget, and that's what they use to offset any costs. We also have the advanced opportunity grant um, that allows us to pay for um, other things. So last year, um, like 350 students that took concurrent enrollment, and then through the advanced opportunity grant, we paid them. Uh, each, we give $200 out of pocket, or $200 to each parent for any out of pocket expenses and that's exactly what the advanced opportunity uh, grant was designed for so you know, a lot of this is just it's all pretty much uh, budget neutral the um, SPL so the, the one that's up there right now from uh, Flathead High School so it kind of emulates the one at, at Glacier where it's the self-paced map uh, the one thing that they're looking at doing is a little bit different with some software so we would have to look at getting some Alex uh, software which we currently have which they have through a grant through the uh, KEF but the offset to that would be they would no longer uh, need the MAP 180 um, software that we're paying for at Flathead High School so a lot of these are um, just kind of a, a trade-off so one thing that they are looking at and so we're working through on the on the SPL for Flathead High School is uh, a classroom set of Chromebooks so we're going to work through that, but that's a technology decision from um, Eric and Jason. You know, can we can we add additional um, Chromebooks to the class? But those those will be used as a classroom set um, specifically for this class. But everything else is uh, budget neutral uh, for the most part, and um, a lot of them are. If you have the opportunity to read through them, a lot of them are concurrent enrollment. Uh, so that means uh, the teachers are teaching the classes uh, here in this building. The students are also getting uh, credit at College Forum, and the college is paying. Any, any questions? Yeah. How do you balance the new, uh, and I understand it's all budget neutral, but how do you balance that with maybe the, uh, and I see where there there's, uh, I guess of student enrollment in each one of those. But how do we address reduced offerings when we don't have enough students in those classes in order to uh, reduce some of our overall costs of, of programming or curriculum delivery? Because uh, that would be one of the first. Now, I understand budget neutral, but what other kind of things are going to be addressed for reduced offerings? Um. That's a great question, Jack. So appreciate that. So, <laughs> so obviously, you guys know that the um, you know the registration process is is driven by the students. So if the students sign up, um, that requires some shifting of FTE. So if more students are signing up for art and less are signing up for business classes, usually we have to you know usually we have to shift FTE. Uh, the other thing you know that you look at. So you know right now we're looking at current FTE. And I'll just use the high school as an example. And as we go through the budget development process, you know, if we need to cut back on our on our FTE within our buildings in order to meet, you know, our budget, whether that's through attrition or whatever we however we want to look at it, then basically then um, you know, then the students' numbers increase in each of those classes. And then also, you know, one of the things that they look at is, and we haven't quite talked about this yet, but is there a minimum number of students that need to be enrolled before a class will go. 
uh, you know, so that that drives a little bit. So if you take a look at Bozeman, what they did last year, that's exactly what they said. You know, hey, we want butts in the seat, and here's the here's the number. If it doesn't have 15, it's not going to go. Um, there were a few exceptions within that. So you know, so all of those are taking into account. You know, when we're looking at that within within each of the buildings. Um, you also have to you know look at as we start moving towards more work-based learning and opportunities like that. Um, so concurrent enrollment, uh, it's a running start class that's taught in our building. Dual enrollment is taught at the college. They're still given dual enrollment, but if you have more classes like that, um, then yeah, there, there is a reduction and that fits into, you know, our basically our budget development. So how are we looking at that? So it, it's, it's a pretty big puzzle that we look at and, you know, we take a look at the resources and, and we allocate with them. Well, and I understand all the moving pieces and all that. I just want to make sure that that's on our mind because of the transformational learning, work-based learning, and all, and all that. That's going to change the curriculum offerings. Uh, but I'm just wanting to make sure we still are reminded of the fact that we might have to pursue minimum uh, uh, seat time or minimums for the number of people in the chairs. We've had, we've had discussions. Thank you. Any further questions, Ursula? <clears throat> I was just going to add because I was actually going to talk about what Pete just talked about, and he kind of said it really quickly. I don't know if everyone does know for sure, but one of the things that the district does that is unique is build its schedule around student choice. And that's actually a really big deal. It's one of the things that we're already doing that is so exceptional. And so the amount of units that are offered of things is based on kids' interest in it. And if there are classes that kids aren't taking, a lot of times those are the classes that come through and they say, we're going to get rid of these. It's not working anymore. We're going to try something else. And so um, it is just something that I think the district is already doing exceptionally well. And I'll just add just a couple other things just on the Glacier side. So uh, having <clears throat> consternation about some of the classes that were offered at, at um, Glacier High School, you know, the anthropology and basically the German. Um, I said, hey, I've, I've been around when German was around. And I said, it's really difficult to, to fill. And, you know, what is the expectation? Um, you know, and what sold me was, you know, when Brad and, you know, the people that proposed this was, um, hey, this is a, a concurrent enrollment class. You know, offering to students, you know, let them decide. Plus, if we're reaching out, whether we're doing this for our charter schools or whether in our regular school, so, um, you know, if, if this is something that a homeschool student would want to take, why would, you know, why would we offer it so that they're getting uh, the, um, the concurrent enrollment credit for it, and then we're also getting the A and B. And so, I said, oh, you, you got a pretty good point there, but, you know, so there was a lot of discussion, you know, with the the administration within the curriculum committee, um, and then they also have to be the department. Rebecca? Just a comment from the curriculum committee. It was, it really seemed like the entire curriculum committee was really excited about the courses offered this year, that there's a lot of um, breadth and depth that we haven't had before being offered, and it was really pretty exciting to see a art welding class come through for the first time. Uh, that conversational Spanish um, go through uh, all the anthropology offerings at the um, at Glacier to really see that we are still moving forward with offering students exciting choices that they haven't had before was very exciting. Okay. Anybody willing to make a motion? So moved. Thank you, Ursula. Do I have a second? Thank you, Sue. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this? No. Any public comment? None. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. <laughs> Education tax grant. Randy or Chris? This is the... Uh... Summary of our Innovative Education Grant. Um, excuse me, our Innovative Education Tax Credit that we have done. We're super thankful for our community to uh, rally to these funds this year. Uh, last year we had uh, 96 
$6,700 for 10 donors. This year we raised $732,750 from 29 donors, almost seven times as much. Mm -hmm. And so uh, really shows the support is out there for our education uh, in the community for our school district. And so I'd just like to you know, thank everybody that took the time to do this. And also, uh, obviously, there were some big donors this time that we didn't get in the past, but at the same time, a lot of people came forward and made donations. And so these grants, uh, <clears throat> these donations will go towards uh, very innovative programs that we're establishing here that we've been talking about throughout the year. That is, that is, I'm excited. Okay, moving on. Oh, sorry, Rebecca, yes. Brandy, perhaps I didn't catch it. Could you give us those numbers as percentages of our maximum possibility? Like this year we were at like 75% of what we could have done. How, how close were we last year? Yeah, we were at 73.2% uh, 73, uh, this year of what our maximum was. Okay. Uh, last year we were less than 10%. Woo-woo! Now you get your woo-woo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really good. And split almost evenly. It's hard to do it because the check size is very, but uh, it was split uh, about 360, 70. Set up in the K-12 district, or can we do K-8 and 9-12? That answer. It's, it is here, yeah, 9 and 9-12. Yeah. That was that was a great update. I was excited when I got to hear about that. Okay, moving on. Resolution. Um, Southall Elementary Electron. Oh, Chris, you're up. Election. Oh. <laughs> oh. I'm on the high school one. All right, so I'm um, not really sure what people said in the past. I may talk about this. Um, we have two elections that we'll be running this year. Three elementary trustees are up, and then we have one at the high school level. Um, this is just formality. We have to have this done by a set date. We are in advance of that. Um, and then it also stays on there for the elementary and um, for the high school. Um, the elementary, we will potentially be running the tech levy. It is on the resolution, but we still have the option, of course, to withdraw that. And then at the high school, the um, general fund levy is listed there. The rest of it is just kind of informational where the elections will be held, the hours of the polls are open. Thanks, Chris. We're looking for a motion, two separate motions. I need elementary election only. Two. I move to approve the resolution calling for an election. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Jennifer. Sorry, I didn't see a light on. <laughs> I didn't. <Never. laughs> That's okay. It's been moved and seconded. Do we have any comment on this discussion, Ursula? I feel like we got an update on this. The when was the last time we asked the county if they would run our election? We ask them again this year? No, it, it, I, I don't believe so. Um, the, there, there was some legislation that tried to get past this last session on counties running them and um, any traction. Are you thinking you might ask them next year? Okay, yeah. Okay, okay we'll keep asking. Lynn. Chris, do you know, I know the last school election, there seemed to be a significant number of ballots that were not delivered. I don't know if the county has worked on getting there. there uh, let's say the address is correct. Right. There was some update done between the state and the county where addresses um, got lost. I will find out if they've corrected that. And Everything has been resynced appropriately, but I don't know as of right. Thank you. Yeah, but the addresses were wrong. And there were a lot of yeah. there were boxes and boxes of ballots left down there um, at the election office that they were never delivered. 
Because we'll oh, use. I thought you were talking about the city council no. election where the no. was wrong, but we're in a different subject. Oh, there's like about 5,000 of the uh, 5,000 of the posted right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And Chris, um, I remember the last time we ran this election, um, because my district is up for re-election, it gets extremely confusing with district lines. So I'm, I would recommend checking in with them earlier rather than later to make sure that they've looked into that process. Um, it just gets really confusing, and I'm not sure if any of the outlying districts will be running an election at the same time. They did three years ago. Okay, any other further comment on this discussion? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded. Elementary only, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion passes. Up next, we've got the resolution for the high school election. Same information. Anybody willing to make a motion? Move to approve the resolution calling for an election for one. Thank you, Jen. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. It's been moved and seconded. Any comment on this one? <laughs> okay. Seeing none. Any public comment? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes. Okay. Comprehensive needs assessment. Randy. Uh, this is just notification that you'll be getting this as part of our um, uh, accreditation process this year and a part of the integrated strategic action plan that we have to complete to complete our accreditation process this year. Uh, the accreditation process is new this year, so this is one part of it. And so what we do then is we uh, use this um, comprehensive needs assessment, once we get it, we create our gap analysis and then we write SMART goals that will be in place strategically approached by the district for the next three years. Uh, you'll see that the first one listed there is school board members, 59 questions. That seems like a lot of questions, but at the same time, it's one through four. Uh, one is that not being accomplished or least likely the four being well accomplished or they're doing it great. And it's mostly perception data, what you what you perceive is going on in the school district. And so those are the types of questions. Uh, so if you get an email from me that says comprehensive needs assessment, there's an attachment, uh, don't delete it. <laughs> Fill it out and return it to me. Okay. And so then there's also one for business we'll be talking to the Chamber of Commerce about trying to get them to distribute it for us, not 22 questions. And so then we also, we currently do our staff, our community, and our uh, students. We're proceeding with those also at the same time as we're working on these. And then there's a copy there of uh, the integrated strategic action plan that we have to fulfill to meet our accreditation requirements. Uh, if you get some time or if you have already take a look at that, there's 15 areas that we have to complete this year. And then it also tells you what we have to do next year, year two of it. I think that was discussion. Anybody have any questions about that? No? We're seeing none. Let's move on. Elementary tuition fund. Chris? Okay, so just to give a little bit of context, um, in special education, I'm sure everybody's most of you are aware, but um, we have some self-contained programs um, with preschool being one of them. And typically what happens is at the end of a school year, we look back and take the cost of that specific program and then um, levy the portion of the cost that isn't um, supplemented by the state's A and B funding. Preschool is a little bit of a different animal in that we get no state funding but are still required to run preschool by law. And because of that, we are able to permissibly levy the full amount of our preschool programs less um, the IDA preschool funding that we get. The IDA preschool funding we get currently is about $31,000 or $41,000, so not a significant amount up on the screen. 
you can see what the cost of last year's preschool program was and just a little bit of kind of general info talk. We had about 27 students in the program. Uh, staff, salaries, and benefits that were directly in that classroom every day were $244,000, 25,000 benefits. And then one to one. So this would be a preschool student that has perhaps an SLP or physical therapy or OT. Those costs were $55,000. And then some additional student costs for equipment to um, meet their needs, making the total cost of the program about $357,000. Um, that less than 41000 of IPA is um, 315000 And this amount was not included in this fiscal year 24's budget. So we will, if passed, go out and um, amend that tuition fund budget. And would this will result in our general fund being relieved by about $315,000. And uh, similar to the retirement discussion earlier, um, the amendment is only for the expense side, and the revenue would be made up in the fiscal year 25 levy. That's a lot of words. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions for Chris on this? I have a motion to approve the proclamation to amend the fiscal year for elementary tuition. Who's Thank you, Jen. Do I have a second? Thank you, Lance. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? None. Any public comment on this? None. Elementary only. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Just Chris? one quick. The, the last is, so this was just a proclamation that we have now post publicly. And then we have to go back after that and post it and do a resolution. So you'll see this come through one more time before we get it done. Okay. Thank you. And just to note, this is a really good catch on Chris's part mm -hmm. yeah. for our elementary budget. Yeah. Well, thanks for explaining it. When I first read it, I was really confused. There's a little bookkeeping error on here. Um, it says we meet at 6.30. We meet at 6.00. Okay, right, up next, policy updates. We're in second reading. Okay, these are the three policies, that, uh, excuse me, four policies that you saw last time. We've updated them and taken out the strikeout and put in the new language, corrected them as to the final form that they'll be in. So um, we went through them last time, so unless there's any specific questions, we'll those in second reading. Um. On the one about the uh, trustees visiting the schools that said except where um, not per, per, not required by law, you said you'd look into what the current law status of the law is for. Do we have an update on that? Sorry, what was the question? Uh, the policy that was about trustees visiting the schools once a year. 1240. It said this, somewhere in it said except as not required by law, and you said you'd look into what, um, where it was not required by law, and I was wondering if we had any information about that yet. Um, I think I did ask about it, but I can't recall what the answer was. I did ask about the other policies. I'm sure I asked about this one today. But um, uh, I can get that to you. Can we ask Andrew while he's here? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca, do you want to ask Andrew? Policy is that, is that acceptable, or is that should we wait till we? Would you rather be approached formally in a different venue? I think that the question would best be posed in a privilege court. Um, we can address it there, maintain the privilege. And hopefully get you there. Okay. So my other comment about it was <coughs> it is as it seems to be now that we've moved from we needed one trustee in each building each year to we need every trustee in each building each year 
I would suggest that maybe in governance we have a discussion about how to make that easier on the trustees to make it. Maybe have some some of our regular meetings at the different schools. We could do a tour right before. Or I think anyway, if if the if the change is as I think it is, I think it would be good to bring up in governance how to make that easy on the trustees or possible. Another thought I'd offer is maybe we just take an entire field trip day and go visit. And we get to write on the bus too. That's okay, that's <clears throat> Jennifer. Well, I it doesn't seem to say that we all have to be there at the same time. Just that we have to make an attempt to be at every school throughout the year <clears throat> of being a trustee. So that would make it. I mean, we would just have to be more diligent about if we miss like the walkthrough to make sure that we go in at some point to meet with that principal. So. I think it's a little bit on us to make sure that happens. Scott? I'd say instead of us sitting here guessing about what it says, <laughs> that we have Randy put a confidential email with a final answer instead of us guessing. I think that's a good idea. And then noted, I think it should be brought up at board governance, too. Okay. So we're in second reading. Not having any action on that tonight. Moving on. Consent agenda, elementary only. Do I have a so move. <laughs> I admit who said it. Jim. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Sorry, it's, okay. Do I have a second? No, second. Thank you, Rebecca. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the consent agenda? None. Any public comment? None. Sherlyn? Okay. Um, elementary only. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Up next, consent agenda district wide. So made. Thank you, Jack. Second. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Does anybody have a discussion on this? Seeing none. Any public comment on this? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. okay, on to the work study topic. I mm -hmm. think that's why we have some visitors tonight to get to this. Um, we also have Andrew with us tonight to help lead this. Andrew, I don't know if you'd feel more comfortable up there or you can have a seat over here. Um, you just have to hit the button when it's red, you're live. Red meeting tone, we don't know why. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon to the Board of Trustees. My name is Andrew Ziggelwind. I'm the Director of HR, Senior Staff Attorney with the Montana School Boards Association. I'm proud to bring you a field of seven uh, applicants for the position of superintendent. Uh, that's quite high, so you're aware, one of the, one of the best polls that we've had. And from a, a field that appears to be uh, quite, quite well qualified, um, I did anticipate that there may be some questions about superintendent licensure, uh, based on the fact that there are a large number of out-of-state applicants, so I'm ready to discuss that. Um, but at this point, uh, where we are in the process is for the Board of Trustees to discuss the applicants based on their experience and qualifications and uh, potentially select a few to interview for uh, that for the week of February 5th for a site visit whatever social the board uh, designs or intends, and then uh, employment interviews uh, for the moment. Um, following tonight's meeting, uh, the next step will be to conduct the reference checks, which we will do on behalf of the board, uh, submit those applicants to the board interviewing for a criminal background check, and formulate <coughs> questions that will be asked during the interviews during February 5th. Um, at this point, I yield to any questions or uh, comments that, that I, I'll ask the one that you talked about, about the licensure process. How, if they aren't, if they don't have a superintendent certification in the state, what is the process for that? Thank you. Uh, so, give you just the, the short answer first. Uh, whatever applicant the board 
select whatever one you are interested in working with, we will uh, make happen in terms of what. One of the things you may have noted from the matrix, from the information about the applicant, is that uh, most of them have doctorates, most also have masters, which that's one of the main elements. You have uh, no applicants that I would characterize as unqualified. Mm -hmm. But with that, there are five steps in Montana. The first is completion verification of an education specialist, master's, or doctoral degree from a professional education uh, program. Uh, a master's uh, in leadership from a regionally accredited college or university. Most, if not all, of the applicants have this qualification already. Next is uh, completion and verification of a school superintendent graduation program. If any of the applicants are lacking this, it's only 15 credits, which we've seen applicants complete that in a year or even less. Uh, so that's quite doable. Verification of a minimum of three years of teaching experience as an appropriately licensed teacher. I don't think we had any applicants. Verification of one <coughs> year successful administrative experience <coughs> license and fine. There are a few applicants who had the majority of their experience uh, as a principal rather than a superintendent. Uh, not many who had the superintendent slash principal uh, category, so that's a huge category. Uh, and a few who were well over that in terms of their as an actual superintendent. Uh, and then number five, completion of three semester credits of college coursework, Montana School of Finance, Montana School of Law, Montana Collective Bargaining and Employment Law, and then the, uh, the small additional matter of completing the online course and introduction. But the, the bottom line is these are easy to be accomplished within a year, uh, uh, or even less if the board decides that you wish to go with one of the other. That address your question. I, <clears throat> my next question, so that did really address it. If we hire someone that doesn't, I, like I hear you saying they absolutely could meet all the requirements, have you ever in your experience seen someone who did not meet the requirements in the time? Yes, and, and how, how you typically handle that is through the supervision of a licensed individual. It occurs to me that if the board selected someone who didn't have the requisite certification right off the top, uh, that uh, interim superintendent Klein's assistance would be valuable. You also have the option that this is something that I don't know if the board would be interested in pursuing, but there is an alternative path, uh, which is the superintendent uh, internship program. Uh, basically where the, the uh, incoming superintendent is assigned someone to supervise them as a part of receiving their, their licensure. Um, it might not be necessary depending on, on details of your current administration, uh, but it is possible. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um, I don't know how you want to go about this. I know in the past we've done kind of a straw poll to see if there were a candidate or two that we didn't feel was at the top of our list. I don't know what you want to do, Andrew. I'm not sure. I, I think I will just start. Um, I mentioned it briefly before, but I'll just remind the board at this point that as an entity done by uh, the United Code of Governmental Fair Practices, you are to make your decision on any prospective hire uh, based on experience and qualifications, nothing more. Um, in terms of your comments tonight, I think that uh, if an individual trustee were to comment on applicant's length of service, the similarity of their school district to Kalispell, uh, those are the sorts of things that would be discussed this evening, experience and qualifications. We, we can't really go deeper than that tonight because it's just We're not solidifying either the number or precisely who we're inviting in for interviews. We're just, we're, what, what do you expect to occur tonight, I guess? Tonight, tonight you will select the individuals that you are interested in interviewing. The only constraint on that decision is actually in the contract with MTSDA because, of course, you guys have the included four meetings and consultations with a member of our superintendent, sir. 
Deborah's staff, which I believe you have already one meeting with Deborah on the book. <clears throat> I'm not sure she was visible. She it was, was on, online. Understood. understood. Okay. The only thing you would have to be concerned about is, is say, for instance, you wanted to interview all seven of these individuals, whether the number of interviews might make time constraints so big that you address that four number of meetings. If that happens, we'll work with you. Um, obviously, we don't, if the full board is interested in doing all seven, we're 100% there for you. We're willing to go all the way. What is common in these circumstances is for a board of trustees to select uh, half the number or slightly more than half. Usually, uh, not every single time, but that's, that's really a Um, I will start this conversation. Um, I looked over the list, and in my mind, um, I, I was looking for three things in our applicants. I was looking that they have some building level experience. I didn't want somebody who only worked from the top. I want them to have, you know, the classroom experience, the counseling experience, something at the building level. I wanted to see what else do my notes say. <laughs> I wanted to see that they have superintendent experience. Uh, we do have a lot with principals, but I we're a, a growing double A district. I think we really need somebody that has that superintendent experience. And I wanted to hear from their references uh, that they had that they were a good communicator. Um, I think, you know, that comes up over and over again. And so I looked at this list, and there are three of the applicants that I would like to interview. Um, I could go four, mm -hmm. but there's at least three that fit those three criteria, in my opinion. Are you, are you prepared to say which three they are? Yeah, I am. I would love to hear that. I'm Matt Simpson, Tom Meyer, and Kimberly Fricker. And, and who would be your fourth? Um, oh, you do ask hard questions. There's <laughs> <laughs> only one other super. Uh, my four. It must have been, was it Joseph Libby? Because he had the superintendent. It was experience. probably Joseph Libby. Yeah. Okay. Scott, did you have a question or comment? Well, my comment was that I'd be willing to interview if I wouldn't go past the yeah. um, What are you, do you have three that you were leaning towards? Sure. Are you prepared to tell the group? <laughs> Yeah, um, I would say Matt Jensen and Flicker as well. Great, Kim. Um, if we're discussing our top three, I am right along with Sue. Those were my qualifications. Those were a lot of things that I thought were important looking at these candidates, but my top three, I didn't have Kim on my list. I went with Matt Jensen, Tom Meyer, and then Joseph Libby. Those were my top three candidates. And I will say that Kimberly Fricker is on my list because I'm looking at the diversity. I don't want to introduce or I don't want to interview all males. And I get the diversity. I think yeah. legally we aren't allowed to face anything. <laughs> I know, but I <laughs> right. Sorry. Ignore <laughs> that, Sherry. Ignore that, Andrew. Right. 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 Andrew's like, oh, I didn't hear Two. that. And my one thing with Kim, I I did like her, but I was not happy with her response. With um, when we asked the two questions, when we we're asking about personalized competency competency based learning. She broke down the definition for us instead of, I felt like she was the only candidate that responded and didn't really have a personal connection to it. 
Um, it was more um, giving us the definition of what it is, and I was looking for more than that. And I felt like that's why I think I was leaning on Tom. I felt like Tom, has, he has an emphasis <clears throat> in personalized learning. Yeah. He's implemented it. He's using it. And Joseph Libby, I don't feel like, I don't recall, I don't think they're using it, but I feel like he looked into it before he really responded to that question. I must have been on Kimberly on that one specific one. I, I didn't bring him. Because he didn't have my email saying we're doing this tonight. <laughs> um, oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, I thought that she defined it and then said what she, I, I thought we clearly laying out, this is the difference between these three things and this is what I think about them. I, I, I read it differently. Like I said, this is the Ursula? Okay, I already put the pressure on other people. I, I will say where I was looking at, um, the overlap for sure is Tom Meyer and Matt Jensen. And then I was also considering both Joseph Libby and Kimberly Fricker. And um, they were very different candidates, you know, which is how I kind of went back and forth with that for one. Um, Joseph Libby has, is in a small district now has been in some big districts, but not really in that leadership role as much. And so that's something Kimberly Fricker is in a large district with a big budget. Um, the, the thing that Kimberly Fricker had that stood out to me a little bit was when she talked about the 17 unincorporated rural districts or rural schools. And it's not districts. I know that we are unique in our rural districts. But the unincorporated rural schools, I felt, did have application to what we were going for, whereas Joseph Libby had application to some of those like personal learning things. So I felt like they both had things that made them interesting candidates and um, for very different reasons. I would be comfortable interviewing both or neither of them. For you, Alyssa? I, a list? I do. I'm right on with you guys with the Tom, Matt, um, Kim, and Joe. <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think doing four would be good. And I'm just like a people, like I have to see people. Mm -hmm. okay. Chris, how about you? Do you have a preference? Um, I was Matt, Tom, and Joseph, not Kimberly. You know, I just echo Jennifer's that uh, it sounds like the top four names in some order are coming up, and I'm right there. And I, I think we should be four people and not splitting it on which one to. <clears throat> Rebecca? Um, so it sounds like nobody has spoken for John Hewitt. Is the idea that that's not something we want? Is there anybody who feels, I guess it's not here, is there anybody who feels that name's in, or could we not one off? Five dollars. Um, and Brent Okay, hold on one second. We, so we're are we all on the same page with? Um, guys, I haven't heard John Hewitt's name come up once. Uh -uh. Are, we are those ones you're interested in? Are you no, 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 no. I mean, I, I'm just trying to. I think we. I don't think we've talked about the ones we're not interested in. I think we've been focusing on the ones we are interested in to keep it positive. Yeah. Oh no, that's what I wanted to say. It's like, are we getting? You know. I think. I, I think guess the one getting. person I whose name I haven't heard where I was <clears throat> quite interested in is Megan Dawson. I was really interested why that name had not come up to me. That was mm -hmm. an obvious one. You know, close by, ties to our community, doctorate rather than master's degree. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that that was a very interesting looking candidate, and that's the name. That's the one name that I haven't heard others mention. Krista? Any comments? She's only been a principal for one year, and I was going off the fact mm -hmm. that the other people have been superintendents for multiple years. That was my reasoning mm -hmm. as to why. She's she, actually, I think she's actually been a principal 14 years. She's only oh, one in her, her current, current position. position. Sorry. So she has yeah. been a principal 14 years. And I Sorry. think the only reason I eliminated her. Yeah, from my list was the fact that we do have some really strong candidates who do have superintendent background. And I think that was a deciding factor. Rebecca, do you have any um, a list I'm, of I favorites? I'm not willing to say I'm, I would like to interview Megan because I really did find her answers intriguing. I felt like 
is looking specific. One of the things I was looking for is somebody who did their homework was interested in our district, and I felt that she was one of the stronger people on that scale. Um, but no, beyond you know, everything everyone said, um, I'm for four, not three, I think. Especially if one is local, I don't, you know, travel as much as they do, organization as much as they do. I think four candidates is very doable, but I would sort of like to be Megan in that mix of my but I really thought her answers were very thoughtful. Jack, do you have your favorite? Uh, I'm doing everybody uh, at um, Joseph and Kimberly, and I can go with just three. I don't have to go with four. Um, yeah, I'd echo the, the group as well with those four candidates. I'd be happy to go with three if we thought that'd be better from a time management standpoint, but. I just want to uh, thank NCSCA. I feel like this pool of candidates and the applications, <coughs> you know, the, the applications and the pool that we have to choose from, and I'm confident that we can. Yeah, yeah. I agree. This was a great pool. Um, my question would be now that. Um, Rebecca, I feel like you're the only one who is interested in Megan. Are you okay with eliminating Megan? Okay. So my yes. next question, I think I would like to know, do we want to interview three or four? I also want, um, what was the final decision that we decided at personnel to bring in candidates? <clears throat> what, what did we decide we were going to be doing? We didn't have a meeting. Remember we had a, we were planning, we had discussed flying in oh, candidates, gotcha. putting them up. Five. Doing five candidates? Could you give us a number? Well, I just want that in the forefront. If we're, we're going to be paying to bring them in, I want us to make sure. Do we want? Um, do we want to interview four or three candidates? One candidate will be local here. So we, if we do four, we'll be flying in, bringing in three candidates and putting them up in a hotel. Right, Liz? Am I? Uh, we had landed on a monetary amount up to. Yeah, we I just can't remember. Were we offering airfare or? No. So what we ended up, and correct me if I'm wrong on this list, but it was $500. And then had some skin in the game as well. <coughs> and not just say, hey, you get a free trip to Kalispell. That's what we felt when we discussed that. We kind of went around. I wasn't sure what we Okay. Again. I think this hire is important enough that um, kind of irrespective of, not wholly irrespective of the cost, we, we want to talk for we talk for. And I mean, it doesn't seem like we're putting money in there. So I'd say we could do I'm good with that. I'm just making sure everybody's on the same page so everybody knows. Jack. I'll take the, uh, to me, it's the $500 isn't enough to cover airfare and hotels for two to three nights, and the number should be closer to $1,000 per person. And you got to remember, we're hiring a significant individual here, and we have to have some respect for that individual, regardless of the skin in the game. Uh, but whether hair, airfare or lodging, those are going to be the big prices. And uh, I understand the need to put some limits so that they don't stay at Lake, Fish, Lake Lodge. But at the same time, I don't think we need to be cheap either. Kristen. Andrew, what do people typically do? What do schools do? Do you know? Uh, this this is actually uh, comparatively rare. Um, the only thing that, that we think is important, I mean, it's really up to the board to determine. I do uh, echo uh, Trustee Fallon's concerns about the $500 figure, uh, just in terms of from most regional airports, that's not. 
Um, the most important thing is that the Board of Trustees creates a motion, right? It's up to a certain amount. I don't think that you should be authorizing indefinite charges uh, or trying to dictate what type of, of uh, accommodation the individual will use when they're here. Just set a cap and be done with it. Yeah. Yeah. You should pay economy airfare and not to exceed $200 a month in a hotel and then whatever daily and medium I is. Night, yeah, two hundred dollars. Not to exceed two hundred dollars a night in a hotel, and then whatever the the uh, uh, Montana government per diem is for food. Yes. Second. <laughs> okay. There's I'll a motion second. on the floor. It's been seconded. I already got it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> made and seconded. Did everybody hear that motion? Yeah, you will you repeat it again? Motion. <laughs> Carrie, did you get that motion? It would be moved to pay for economy airfare uh, and not to exceed two hundred dollars a month or a, a night a night at a hotel and uh, the Montana per diem not to exceed two hundred dollars a night for three nights at a hotel. Thank you. And then the uh, state uh, per diem rate for reimbursement for food. Matt's going to get a little vacation. <laughs> He's going to Whitefish Lake Lodge. <laughs> okay. I think Matt is going to Whitefish Lake Lodge. Just take a vacation. Take the money. Okay. Yeah. It's been moved and seconded. Um, any discussion on this motion on the floor? <clears throat> so this motion is just talking about the cost. We are talking about, well, we have a second motion for who we are. Okay. Let's just clear up the cost and then we'll decide how many. Jennifer. Uh, just to kind of be devil's advocate a little bit, but like, do we want to cap the airfare too? Kind of see like what's reasonable for. That's, that's why I use the phrase economy. Because it's going to be different coming from whichever. Airport. You're coming from Iowa. Well, we I, I fly budget economy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to distinguish between first class and regular class. Right. Not business. Correct. <laughs> that was the purpose of the word economy. I think that's understandable. And I don't think anybody who's coming in who wants this position is going to run up a huge bill and then slap us with the bill later. Um, I, it kind <clears throat> of undermines what Scott said about having them have in the game. Scott, do you have any thoughts about this is like a big change to what you were kind of saying? Our conversation at personnel. So this went around and around because it, you can see both sides. Yeah. Scott brought this to our attention and it made perfect sense. I mean, who doesn't want a free vacation to Kalispell, Montana? So that's where the skin in the game came in. We were kind of negotiating numbers and Jack came up with a reasonable number, we thought, and but we never really finalized anything. So I'm glad we're having this discussion with everybody. Yeah, yeah I think nobody wants I mean, who wants to give up three days of their life to leave their beautiful house and their lovely family to, you know, be in the ice cold Montana in winter? Um, but <laughs> does somebody remember what we did last time? Six months ago, or a year ago. Somebody remember what we did. We didn't do anything last time. We offered no stipend, no airfare, nothing. I understand this is a rarity to offer. So we're okay. breaking uh, standards by just. Why are we offering then? 
Hold on, Liz. Okay, hold on one second, one second, Rebecca, hold on. Hold on, Crystal, did you have a comment? I was going to ask what we did last year, but Rebecca asked. Okay, Rebecca. Can, just can we set us up, you know, can we, if our job here tonight is choosing a number and who we're inviting in. Do we do that and do we have to have a number quick? Yes, because they're going to be here on February 5th. Yeah. February 5th, which is. Can the okay. finance committee just set the number? No. No, we'll we have to approve it. We'll board. Technically, we don't have that on. We're not looking for a motion with that. We have this as an action item to determine what candidates we would like to bring in for an interview. We've added this. So it will have to be in one motion, just like Liz said. So this discussion has to be finalized on yes, we're doing this, or no, we are not offering an incentive. Jack. I'm going to disagree because the, the action discussion information, consideration of possible action applications for superintendent position, that's a broad statement. Okay. And, we, and I think it's better to be specific on the two steps, the cost and then the candidate. And there's nothing in here that prevents the two separate motions at all. It's all part of the superintendent position. So I'm going to disagree with that and say that you can make two separate motions for it. Ursula? <clears throat> we got a little cleared up that this is unusual. I was going to add that not only did we not talk about this last year, but we didn't talk it about talk about it a few years before when we did this process either. Did we Am I correct to believe that we did not pay for any travel the years we hired Micah? I don't remember. Okay. I, is there I a motion on the table? I don't remember discussing something that I didn't need to retain. Let's vote on that and then move to Yeah, so there's the motion. Andrew, just to clarify, can we make this? We have a motion. It's been seconded. Can we? Do you feel like we need to add in the candidates in the same motion or can we do two separate? I think since we are not looking at a uh, consent agenda, correct me if I'm wrong, this is not listed. Not on consent agenda, no. Nope. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. no, this is separate. Okay. So as long as we're not in a consent agenda, the board could have a motion for each individual applicant. Okay. In addition to the, the question. Okay. okay. So before we vote on the motion on the floor, I'd like to say that I think the number, especially if we've never offered I do think 500 is low. I think I would be most comfortable with reimbursement of travel expenses up to $1,000. That's where I am, which I think will end up a little lower than I was talking about. But a bit different than what we're talking about, I think. We have that yeah, motion on the floor. I think we need to get that motion addressed before we move on to other discussion about different. So we have a motion on the floor. It's been moved. It's been seconded. Um, oh, sorry. Any further discussion on that? Any public comment on that? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Nay. Yeah, nay. nay. Do you have those, Jerry? No. Okay, keep your hands up. This side of the This table. Oh, and some. Heather, you voted aye? Mm hmm Motion fail. Okay. Is anybody willing to make a new motion? Do you mind if I zoom in and if I make it through to the second interview? And he said, that's not the way we do it. I can 
had to hear in person in about a week and a half. So that's in Ohio, with 600 bucks. In my own way, got here, was super grateful for the experience. And um, so I didn't need that incentive to be here. I wanted to be here, but I'm really grateful. Whatever you yeah. Well, and we have a little bit of time. They, they're going to have a little more time to look for a ticket um, versus a week turnaround. But thank you, Sarah, for that in, insight. Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. Hold on. Lance. Can I make a motion? I'd like to invite four candidates. Um, Matt Jensen, Tom Meyer, Joseph Libby, and Kimberly. Stricker to interview for Superintendent of School District. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> she beat you. She had her dancing. Chris, Chris okay. had her thing on. So Lance made the motion. Krista seconded. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any discussion on this? I, I will just say, Rebecca, that I do appreciate what you said. I do think that Megan was a strong candidate as well. I, I am also very comfortable with this motion. Jen? So just to confirm, the four, Matt Jensen, Tom Meyer, Kim Fricker, Joseph Libby. Yeah. Make sure I have my right. Okay. Any further discussion? None. Any public comment? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We agreed on that one. Okay. <laughs> um, do we have a motion for the financial part? Rebecca? So I think we do need to be respectful that the uh, they decided 500, and I agree that's a little low, but I thought Jack was a little high, so I'll, I'll put the difference to go to 750 now. So I'd like to move that we do offer $750 in reimbursement of travel expenses for our three, for three of our four candidates. Well, I think you have to offer it for all candidates, right? With travel reimbursement, we assume. Right. I think still you have to offer the same for everybody. Won't so if Matt it, chooses have it. to... If he chooses to fly. No, if he chooses <laughs> to get a hotel room, though, for three days and have some quiet time, he can do that. Is there a second on this motion? Do you have a comment? Nope. You were going to chime in for a second. No? Done? Okay. Leave it as is? Yeah, I'm done. I'm just asking, are we... Is there any or other motion okay. that anybody wants to make? Do we have any other motions on the floor talking about travel reimbursement? I guess I would just say I, I know what we have historically done based on what I'm learning here today. Um, not always necessarily mean what we've done in the past is the right thing to do. Um, so I'm not judging what prior boards have decided in prior situations or prior employees have decided in prior situations. But I do think, I mean, I'm looking at the base salaries of some of these individuals, and we're basically asking them to put their probably, you know, a significant chunk of any money they've set aside for family travel to fly out here on notice. And, I mean... It almost makes me wonder, and I know we've already had the motion to interview four, but I mean, we can save someone that expense with a little more effort on our part. I with it, but um, neither here nor there. I'm fine if we don't offer anything. I'm just saying, you know, you look at these amounts and getting flights from Minnesota and from California and from uh, oh, Iowa, Iowa and hotel rooms in the winter time is just not going to be inexpensive. So. I want to make a motion. What, what's our magic number here before I make a motion? Is there a magic number here, anyone? I mean, they you, you think the five already won. A committee. In a committee. Oh, two people. I just have a question. Like, what if we put it out, like, we'd like to interview you. What if they are like, well, are you going to cover any of my expenses? Like, do we not offer it at first? I think and this. Wait. Sorry. 
I think this goes to Scott's point. They have to put skin in the game if they really want to be here. Yeah. Like put the come if you want to be here, you have to come and interview in person. That's how I feel. Well, and I feel more comfortable having four candidates and one decide I'm not flying all the way out there. Solid candidates. We well, we can amend and they say no, we're not going to withdraw our candidacy, we're not going to come in. So, can't we? Anytime prior to the execution of contracted employment, you guys go right back to square one, we could reopen. Um, the only uh, repercussion would be uh, evaluation of our, uh, your contract with MTSPA, potential for additional charges at one point. We could do a straw poll. You could just see if people thought that they would like to compensate none or if maybe there was a smaller number that we could get to. I would like to know that. Um, is there anybody on the board that is not willing to pay anything for one of the candidates coming out? Four of us. I mean, I'm okay. not willing to pay anything. No, yeah. <coughs> I would, I would pick something. Yeah. Um, so the rest of you all would like to pick up some sort of cost. Can we come to an agreement of a number that we're willing to pick up? Can I just add that this is going to set precedence for any other superintendent that we are going to come up come upon, yeah. and that's it's going to increase and increase and increase and increase. So this is going to set the precedence if we do this for him or her to come here. So. I will also say that I would hate to lose a great candidate because we refuse to pay, you know, for a $500 airfare. I would add to that, too, that I would want to interview them if they're going to follow over $500. How so many good points. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we need a decision. It doesn't sound like there's a motion, so maybe we should just move on to the next agenda. Anyone outside that? You know, the floor who, who I think wants it has to hold on. So, Lance made a good point. We do not have a motion on the floor. If nobody is willing to make a motion, we're going to be moving on from this topic and leave it as is with. Willing to make a motion, we can discuss the motion. Right now, we don't have a motion, so we will be moving. Perfect. Okay. We have six board members who want to say something and not understanding why the problem is. Nobody feels strong enough about it to make a motion. Therefore, we should move on. One, one. I guess the minimum one, amount, I, I tried 1,000, I tried 750, nobody liked it. I guess the amount that was decided in Call it and now was 500, so I can respect that. So I move that we offer to reimburse travel expenses up to $500. Second. Second. Who's been seconded? Anybody want to discuss $500? None. Public comment? None. All in favor say aye. 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 Can you, all, any I'll opposed? Raise your hand. Opposed. I didn't catch who said I. We have one, two, three. I think I said I. I'm like so torn. Can raise a hand on nay. God, are you up or down? <laughs> Is it five and five? I have to decide. I was like still on the fence. Nay. We'll go nay. In our way. Let's move up. Okay. That failed. Okay, so we have four candidates, strong candidates that will be coming in. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now we're moving on. Upcoming <laughs> meetings. Glance over the meeting. See you all there. Upcoming meetings. The one stipulation I have is the board meeting over spring break. Was that ever adjusted? Yeah, but usually get Okay, well, it's on this thing, so I just want to make sure so I can plan it. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like with Christmas. We just only do one that month then? Yeah. Okay. So you
Just have to move it up. Yeah, that's we have what I was wondering if we were moving it or not, and who does that? Okay. We'll look over that with Sherry and so you me figure out if it's canceled or being bought. Okay. Um, motion to adjourn. So move. Well, hold on. Who made the motion? You can give it to Jin. Okay. Jin seconded Second. by Second. Ursula. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Okay. Thank you. That wasn't so bad. Thanks, Andrew.